Welcome to another episode of The Next Big Thing, a podcast where we talk about mega trends and exciting innovations changing the world. Today we are talking about augmented reality. Now imagine a world where digital and physical realities blend seamlessly, where artificial intelligence, AI, not only enhances but personalizes your interaction with the world around you. This is the transformative potential of augmented reality and it's rapidly becoming a game changer across industries. I'm Mubeen Tahir, Director of Macroeconomics and Thematic Research at Wisdom Tree and today I am joined by Mark Sage, Executive Director at The Area, which stands for Augmented Reality for Enterprise Airlines, a member-based organization focused on the widespread adoption of augmented reality. I saw Mark present at the AI World Congress event in May 2024 in London, and I was fascinated by his case studies for augmented reality AR adoption and his insights into how AI is going to play a key role in this space. I'm delighted that we can share all of that with our audience on this podcast. Before we begin, I do need to state the following to clarify the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Wisdom Tree and in this episode, Mark Sage, and are subject to change. Anything we present in this podcast is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast research, nor as investment or tax advice. The information and opinions expressed in this podcast are not a recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any securities, and reliance upon them is at the sole discretion of the viewer. Please remember, past performance is no indication of future results. So with that, to kick things off, Mark, how about you give us an overview of uh, what the area does and your own career journey that uh, led you to work at uh, at area and develop this interest in augmented reality. Welcome to the show. Take it away. Thanks, Mobin. Thank you very much for having me. Super excited uh, to be here there. Yeah, so Mark Sage, I've been leading the area, and as you mentioned, Augmented Reality Enterprise Alliance for the past eight plus years, which really seems like a lifetime. Um, my journey to get there um, is I actually left school at 16 and was lucky enough to work in a startup almost straight away. But strangely, it was the electricity company selling gas. Having spent time there, really understanding the fundamentals of business, I did some IT consultancy and ended up at Orange, uh, one of the mobile operators, which had a a big impact on my life. I started there when the mobile business was just about starting. Um, was lucky enough to launch the first mobile device, sorry, the first Android mobile device in both um, France and the UK. And towards the end of my career there, I got really involved in looking at um, mobile platforms and importantly, working with other organizations to come together to, to define requirements. So very much alliance building. And that kind of experience led me, uh, luckily, onto the area. The area was very new. It had been going for about um, two years at the time. A couple of people that I was working with, with companies like Intel and Samsung, were interested in augmented reality. So I was lucky enough to get the role. Uh, It's been a really interesting journey. Augmented reality is a technology that's been spoken about for a long time. And I'm going to perhaps give a little bit of history on that in in a few minutes. But um, what I found over this, the the past eight years, it's really interesting how the technology continues to improve and to um, yeah, solve real business problems almost daily. You know, it's been it's been a journey. My focus, just to be clear, my beam is mainly on the enterprise space, so not so much B two C. It's more in the B two B place, um, but the actual area itself it's a combination of companies who are deploying the technology enterprises so some of the big names like boeing and raytheon and lockheed martin and exxon mobil then we have a group of the providers of the technology which we break down towards hardware and software and we'll talk a little bit more about devices and um, different types of devices but also to some of the software players who range from big platform players like ptc and to so right the way down to startups. And then we have a third group, which we kind of bundle near enough everything else in together under the kind of non-commercial banner. 
and in there are universities, uh, research institutes, government agencies and standards organizations. And it's really that opportunity to come together, to learn from each other, to develop best, best practice. And I think most importantly, overcome some of the barriers to adoption in deploying augmented reality in the enterprise space. In your presentation, and I re I'll keep referring to your presentation because I saw you present at the AI World Congress uh, event. I know in your presentation, you showed a very nice illustration of a continuum where on the one hand, you have the real environment. I suppose that's where people uh, sit on dinner tables, shake hands and so forth. And on the other hand, uh, there, there is the virtual environment where you know, some people are now starting to grapple with what the virtual environment is. You know, we've seen VR uh, headsets and, and so forth, transporting people into, uh, into uh, games, video games and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but within those two extremes, there is a, a spectrum uh, which is sort of uh, defined or as you defined as uh, a continuum of mixed and extended reality. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, I think it would be very useful for you to just explain what that spectrum is and explain particularly what augmented reality particularly means on that spectrum. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Mbobi. It's You're absolutely right. And with a lot of technology, kind of the being able to understand the terminology is part of one of the biggest challenges. So you're right, in the continuum I speak about, there's the, the real world that we live in and spend you know, all of our time in or most of our time. The other end's the virtual world where you actually have a VR headset on and it's all made virtually. Augmented reality is about putting digital content on top of the real world. So as an individual, you can still see the real world with your own eyes. Now, that could be through a headset that has a, a visor or something coming down and you're looking at the real world through that and it's putting digital content on top of it. It could be, and we call that augmented reality. There is also assisted reality, which could be just as simple as a little um, uh, thing comes down. You can look at a screen and then there could be, you could look at, I don't know, videos, PDF, simple step-by-step -step instructions. We often call that assisted reality. I think there's a kind of slight confusion uh, around the terms extended and mixed reality. You know, mixed reality, I believe, came from kind of Microsoft trying to position themselves slightly differently. And we've obviously got spatial computing as well, which is kind of Apple's communication as well. I think the, the big change in what I call extended reality is where you have a VR headset and you can press a button and see the real world but you're not seeing it through your eyes, you're seeing it through a camera or a set of cameras. Okay, so you can still do a lot of the things that you can do in AR, and obviously by pressing the button, you can go back into the VR environment. I think from in terms of use cases and, and the way forward in the future, we're still working through what that technology actually solves. Um, you know, it's certainly great for training, but you probably wouldn't want somebody on the shop floor doing a maintenance task or a manufacturing task with a kind of a pass-through VR headset just in case something went wrong and suddenly they couldn't see the world. You know, so hands in a machine or something like that. So as with a lot of this technology, it's about being very clear on what problems you can solve and what use cases you can solve that, you know, best uses the technology and, as I said, solves those real business problems. If we look back at the history of AR, I know in your presentation you mentioned uh, Boeing and how they've been using AR since the late 1980s, early 1990s. Now, of course, uh, we think when we talk about technology, you think that the technology has come a long way in, in you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, I suppose AR has had a similar journey, uh, but still we, we think that for most people, AR is perhaps not part of their day-to-day -day vocabulary in the same way as, say, making video calls is, which is a technology that came maybe a lot later, became mainstream a lot later, but is much more widespread and well-adopted. So what factors do you think... Uh, have come together in this present moment now to boost the widespread adoption of augmented reality from this point onwards? And the simple answer is there's lots of things, of course, um, which isn't simple, but you know, I think that the technology has been worked on from a kind of a graphic and a 
um, lens perspective for quite a number of years. You know, it's some difficult physics problems to solve when you're trying to overlay digital content on top of the real world. And, and again, just to emphasize that digital content can be in 3D. You can walk around it, you can look through it, over it, you know, and, and have a complete immersive experience within it. So there's been a number of headsets that have come on or wearable devices that have come onto the market. Um, you know, but they may not always be as robust as we'd like them to be. So in some industrial settings, it makes it a little bit more difficult to deploy them. But please remember, most people have an AR head, uh, device in their pocket, which is a mobile phone. You know, and we all probably remember the, the craze of Pokemon Go from four or five years ago. Well, that was an example of AR happening, again, a bit more in a consumer environment, but people were putting their phones and looking at these Pokemons, but they weren't actually there in the real world. So, you know, it's about, it, technology has been around for a while. We're seeing some real interest in places like museums or a place which has some history that you're able to see what it looked like previously um, and often takes you on a nice journey of showing what's kind of happened over a period of time as well. Um, I've certainly seen, a, and, the, and the ecosystem seen a big boost on uh, the COVID time, and a particular use case was remote assistance. As, you, as we all probably remember, we weren't allowed to go into the offices or into the kind of manufacturing environments, so there was a skeleton crew there. If something did go wrong and they weren't able to fix it, they could then start to use this technology, be it a wearable device or even a tablet or a phone, and actually speak to a remote expert, anybody in the world, and actually show them what the problem was. And then they could overlay, be it through kind of drawing or content that was already there, like arrows and things like that, what needed to be done. And that saved a lot of companies at the time that, you know, if, if there was a fault or something wasn't working, they would have to wait, probably clear some people out of the factory, bring other people in. So there was a big boost around that time on the remote assistance use case. But now we're seeing it kind of exploding into all sorts of areas from training to kind of step-by-step -step guides of how to implement um, different whatever processes. Um, the visualization of content is always very strong. Inspection use cases. Again, remember my, my focus is very much on the enterprise space, but you know, there's lots in the creative industry, healthcare. You know, there are lots and lots of different use cases. And I still feel after eight years of doing this, we're still scratching the surface of some of the things that will be and can be done in the future. I imagine one of the things that is probably very different today compared to how AR was being done decades ago is the hottest technology of our times these days, artificial intelligence. And of course, these days, everyone is trying to create a connection between AI and how AI can impact different industries. And I imagine there's a, a very strong connection between AI and AR. And I know you make that connection yourself as well. And it seems like it's an intuitive one. We have large language models which can uh, give us customized responses. If we pair that up with augmented reality, I, I suppose the possibilities could be endless. Give us your take on how important AI is to the evolution of AR? Huge, absolutely huge. Uh, just one thing to be clear about though, they're not dependent on each other, okay? They are two technologies coming together to make, you know, it's the one plus one equals three situation. I have a, a very simple view on this. You know, if you really take it down to its bare bones, augmented reality is about displaying content. And AI, to a certain extent, is about managing or creating content. And this is where the two overlap. So again, some kind of really nice, simple use cases. Um, we're seeing lots of companies, historically, they would have told somebody how to do a process by giving them step-by-step -step instructions. But that was kind of very predefined. Now, through Gen AI, the person can ask questions and get different kind of context and content back as well. So I think it's helping us to improve how we do things. It's providing the most contextual, relevant, up-to-date information to the worker when they need it. 
And also, you know, the other part, when, when we move on to more of the machine learning models and things like that, being able to recognize and identify uh, almost anything, but using AR as well. So you're using the glasses, you want to have a look at a part of an engine, AI automatically understands what the engine looks like and identifies that part or that widget. And then there's a whole bunch of things that can spring off from that, you know, to order a new one. It could be that there's information to say, well, that's getting close to, you know, needing to be replaced. So the preemptive kind of maintenance, you know, it's it's having a huge impact. And I I also run through the area a an AI and XR working group which includes the kind of sister organization of the area digital twin consortium and our parent con um, company object management group omg and recently we've started to kick off these kind of work streams and we had over 60 or nearly 70 different companies just coming along to understand you know how the technology is working together and most importantly and the first thing that we're doing is being able to understand the kind of actual use cases that people are doing now, but the potential use cases. So we're really beginning to collect all this information. It's fascinating what people are coming up with and actually doing with the combination of these two technologies. I liked uh, when you mentioned earlier that uh, we, we all carry augmented reality devices in our pockets, you know, in the form of mobile phones. Uh, but uh, in your presentation and, and certainly in your earlier uh, responses you mentioned variables you know like uh, uh, some sort of uh, glasses which uh, can can provide various functionality and so forth and I think there was a statistic in your presentation about 47 million augmented reality smart glasses being expected to be shipped by uh, 2027 uh, we know that devices are getting smarter as, and certainly one of the trends in devices is you know, even devices are going to become uh, not just connected, but capable of doing of doing AI on the device. So you're not necessarily having to speak to a cloud-based application to come up with certain responses. I imagine that's uh, something that again uh, impacts the AI, the AR world. Tell us about the evolution in devices. Now I know you mentioned you know Boeing was using AR. Uh, in, in the 80s, mm -hmm. I imagine the, the, the devices, the wearables that someone at Boeing is is wearing today compared to the 80s has, has come a long way. Uh, what's been the evolution in the hardware, the devices, and what are the key trends to watch in this space? Yeah, and if you see a picture, I've got, um, I think I showed an image at the talk of the, the kind of wearable, and it was huge. It was a great big device with lots of wires hanging out how to bit and stuff like that. But again, it was to do the wiring diagram so they could actually see where the wiring could or should be within an aircraft. I think what we've had um, in terms of the evolution so far is certainly from a wearable devices perspective, they've been, let's say, kind of generic devices. They've been able to deliver AR experiences, but they've possibly not been kind of focused on particular industry or particular use cases. And I think that's what we'll see in the next evolution of devices, that they're going to be a little bit more tailored to particular um, problems to be solved and potentially to particular industries as well. Uh, you know, every industry has its own nuances. If we think of construction or healthcare, there are regulations that need to be done and stuff like that. So I think one of the things that the, the devices themselves will become a little bit more tailored to particular industries. I think the other thing is all about um, the power of the devices. And as more and more is pushed to the kind of cloud edge and things like that, processing can be done there and brought back very quickly, which allows the devices just to focus on the, the kind of visualization part as well. Um, I think safety is going to be an important factor as well. You know, these devices need to be safe. I, I mentioned earlier, you know, part of the issue with VR glasses in an industrial environment is if they don't work, you, you have a big risk. So, you know, they need to be safe. They need to be kind of um, available and workable in the environments. And the other big concern and has been right the way through to, if people remember the Google Glass, which was, you know, probably eight, seven, eight years ago, is around the security side. And this works on a number of different levels. And I think the evolution will show that this can be done, but you know, 
companies are concerned, you go in with a device that has lots and lots of different cameras and um, sort of elements to be able to capture data, you're going to be capturing all sorts of things within a company. It could be the latest designs. It could be people and what people are doing and stuff like that. So I think security from a usage within a company is going to be very interesting. Um, I also think kind of security in terms of being able to take that information out of the environment and potentially using it somewhere else is going to be another interesting concern. So, you know, I think that devices are going to get smaller, smarter, safer, more secure. So lots of kind of things. And I'm really looking forward to, and we're hearing some of the other bigger guys beginning to do some work. And there's been a few so-called leaks, I think even this week about some companies delivering some AR glasses. So, you know, it's important. We need more wearable devices that uh, fit for the job. It's a personal anecdote, uh, Mark. In, in recent times, there have been uh, numerous instances where we have received a delivery of a package at uh, our home only to notice that the parcel is addressed to someone we don't know and uh, meant to go to address we don't recognize. Now, in an era, of course, where households are getting multiple deliveries uh, in a single day, of course, uh, mistakes are bound to happen. But I found it interesting how in your presentation you mentioned that even a company like DHL had experienced uh, significant productivity gains and, and reduced their number of errors by introducing augmented reality. Uh, tell us, I know you've alluded to some of the case studies uh, of, of AR, but it would be interesting to take a deeper dive into what uh, you found most interesting in terms of uh, applications of AR across industries, be it DHL or any other example that uh, that that really uh, is your personal favorite. Yeah, and I do like the DHL or, or other you know companies that are doing the delivery one. It's not just um, DHL. Uh, I think that use case is pretty kind of mature now in terms of being able to pick um, and making sure that those parcels are going to the right places. I think some of the really interesting ones that I'm seeing, um, maybe we'll go back to our friends at Boeing and say one of the instigators. And, and even that use case around the wiring diagram is still really relevant today. So historically, how they would have, you know, if you had to put some new wires in or move the wires, and believe you me, there's lots of wires that goes on you know, on an airplane. Um, it's very kind of complicated. They would have had to make or they had made a physical mock-up. And then they would be kind of changing the wires, making sure that there's enough space between them. This was a very um, physical, demanding kind of job and also very much an experts type of job. OK, because when they'd have to change something, they would have to literally move wires through, making sure that everything was OK, not touching. As I said, there was enough um, gap. Now they're using a combination of the Microsoft HoloLens device. Um, and are able to visualize all of the wiring through uh, an augmented view. So they can still be in the fuselage or they can be in a different environment and they can see where all the wires can go. You know, and they can then be a bit more clever. They can remove some of the wiring, you know, based on it might do a certain task. So we say, well, we don't actually need that. We can get rid of it. They're using some um, 3D printed tools to be able to pinpoint where the wiring needs to start and where the wiring needs to end. And currently, they still need the experts to be able to kind of show where it goes and make sure the tolerances and things like that. But I'm sure um, in the future, they'll be able to use AI to do those kind of things as well. So it just shows a very practical use. They've got some other great use cases about putting rivets in. They want to make sure that you get the right rivets in. So they're using AR to make sure that they're putting the right ones in, because if they don't, that's all rework that needs to be done. I think in the, the, the medical kind of situation, there's one that um, we're really excited within the area. So we have a student research award. Every year, we, we like to give two um, reasonably smallish student awards, but to, to universities or to students that are working on AR solutions. And this year, we're really excited to be working with Oakland University. That are, uh, and, and the lady doctor will be using AR to help with breast screening. Um, so my understanding is when, when this happens, if there is any sort of potential issue or dark material, a biopsy is needed, 
and how this is done at the moment is someone is using a kind of camera looking at a screen and then looking or not looking as the case may be but injecting into the breast to to get a biopsy so they're actually looking at a screen and, and putting their hand somewhere else so so the doctor is going to be using ar so they can actually look at the human body and be much better at being able to guide the needle into the place it needs to be. So, you know, it sounds a simple use case, but actually I think it will reduce the amount of training and speed up the number of um, exercises or the number of biopsies that need to, to be done. And, and the lady in question is also very passionate about taking that to other parts of the world as well, where, where there's probably not as much kind of as good medical care. So I think that's another really great example of a simple but effective use case and finally, we've Gier has just finished a piece of research on kind of the inspection use case. So this is where you're doing a task and AR is able to tell you if you've done the task correctly or not. Okay, which is great from an individual worker who may not be that skilled on the task. They're able to get a very good guide, not just step by step and I believe I've done it. The um, AR and AI experience will actually tell them that they've done it correctly. Um, it's also potentially great. I've been to a number of different um, factories where when person's done a work or if it's in a very highly regulated kind of task, someone has to come and check the work. Well, now you can reduce that kind of overhead. And finally, if you have external inspectors, they're able to see maybe live or recorded afterwards that the task has been done correctly as well. So it all builds on that kind of ROI and, and benefits that uh, companies can make by successfully deploying AR technology. I think the, the surgery, the medical application example is just so incredible. And I imagine it probably will, will be used in all sorts of surgical uh, situations where you, you know, your AR devices can really support and, and, and make the surgeon uh, a lot more effective in, in what they're looking to do. Excellent, excellent example, certainly. Thank you. Uh, another one uh, that uh, I remember you, you showed a video um, uh, where a certain repair job had to be carried out. And I personally love that example because uh, being someone uh, for who, um, you know, DIY is not necessarily my forte, let's just say uh, that. Uh, I really like the idea that you can point a, a device, be it a mobile phone or something towards a problem and the device can walk you through uh, the steps for uh, diagnosing the problem and then going through the effective uh, process to get to uh, the repair, the, the solution, and be on your way. Uh, just walk us through uh, what you showed in that video for our audience uh, and, and what that really means for uh, more and more industries in, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. And actually, it's a combination of use cases, which is the bit I really like about it as well. So it, it's from a company called View AR, or View R, um, based in Austria, kind of one of the leading um, companies in this space. What they've, what they've done, they started off is taking basically digital twin information and putting a mapping solution. So the first problem is that something's gone wrong. Where is it? And it can be in quite kind of complicated environments with lots of corridors and stuff like that. So the first thing that the use case and the problem they've solved is the mapping shows them where to go. Great. Once they get there, they have to understand the problem. And like you said, they can use a mobile device, a tablet, or even a wearable device to have a look at it, and it can provide some information. Now, that could be as simple as just identifying what it is, maybe using a code to see what the different pump is or eventually be using AI to do that. And it can tell you what should be happening. Um, and, you know, it could be like, what, what's the temperature or what the, the, does the dial say? It could be a whole bunch of information. Now, so that's kind of taken a step-by-step -step guide. It will tell you what to do. In the example that, I've showed on the video is they still couldn't solve it. So then they go into the remote assistance kind of environment where they then phone an expert. And I mentioned it before in the one in the COVID time. So that's still a very valid use case. But after that, it's then using AI to make sure in this particular instance that they've put the lock back on. And again, it's identifying 
looking at the lock and saying, yes, that's, that's okay. I've used AI to tick that box. You've completed your task. It's a really nice combination. And again, I, I keep on about this. It's about solving business problems. And that's a nice kind of three or four use cases that solve a, could be what, a major business problem if that goes down for a length of time and they have to stop work. You you mentioned a few times tapping into an expert remotely, and that 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 immediately reminds me of an advert I saw on telly. Uh, it was by uh, a telecom company, EE. Uh, I think it's still on YouTube. And and the advert was interesting. It showed a man on top of uh, Mount Snowden, and he mm -hmm. was on the phone speaking with actor Kevin Bacon. Mm -hmm. And Kevin Bacon was sitting inside a barber shop in London. And then Kevin asks the man to put on a cape and take a seat next to um, a robotic arm. And the robotic arm is holding a razor blade, which then proceeds to shave the man. Uh, and all the time it was being controlled by the barber sitting in the London uh, shop. Now, of course, EE were advertising amazing internet connectivity. As, and, and their tagline, and I made a note of this, their tagline was that when your neck, your life, and most importantly, your beard, are on the line, you need a network to count on. Now, <laughs> uh, I suppose there will be lots of situations where you almost want to teleport an expert uh, from one part of the world to another. And these could be situations where, you know, someone's life could be on the line. Uh, we've talked about medical applications. Uh, you know, the doctor might not always be there. You might have to remote them in somehow. Uh, so, uh, you know, Give us a, a couple of uh, takes first. Have you seen that advert? And two, <laughs> um, uh, give us uh, your view on what sort of situations might arise where, you know, potentially very important, uh, th th there might be a need to, to bring in an expert remotely and, 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 and hopefully maybe sometimes the situation has higher stakes than just shaving someone's beard, but maybe someone's life is on the line. Uh, maybe just costs can be saved or maybe a life can be saved. Uh, what sort of things have you seen in industry where uh, tapping into experts remotely via AR is being done? Yes, and I, I have seen the advert. Um, I know it well. I'm not quite sure. Thankfully, I haven't got a beard, so maybe it's not such a problem for me. But uh yeah, you know, I think there's there's all sorts of different levels. I do believe in the future we will be very happy to do that. At the moment, there will probably be a few concerns, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of barriers and hurdles with, with the adoption of the technology. But just to be clear, I think one of the, the important parts, okay, the shaving one is one example, but I think where it really benefits um, the end user and the expert is not just... You can show them what's what's happening. And let's be honest, you could do that with a video call and stuff like that. But to then the actual um, expert needs to explain what to do. Now, with AR and actually putting the digital content on top of it, they can show them what to do and they can take them through a journey and get very, very kind of pinpoint things. So, you know, again, it could be using just points or arrows or something, but you know, very clear, that is the thing you need to do. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting in the future. Do we think that AI is going to overtake that? Well, to be seen, but I really don't believe myself at the moment that you can actually take the, the place of an expert because of the dynamic nature of what's going on anyway. But I think there's an interesting conversation, and these are the kind of things that we're grappling with as AI becomes more um, relevant in the uh, in the industry. Uh, to be honest, I can see all sorts of different things, some boring things like, as I mentioned before, um, processes breaking down, you know, machine failing. Um, it causes downtime. It also potentially causes CO2 issues if someone has to drive or fly to solve these problems. So we're creating some kind of business benefits there. I think on the surgery, you know, being a first responder, we've worked, I've worked quite a lot with different first responders. You know, you need some support there and then, otherwise it could be too late. I'll give you another really interesting and simple example. Um, 
you know, they're often using drones to fly over could be flooded areas. Okay. Now all the drone is seeing is the floods. So it's very difficult to pinpoint any roads or being so they're overlaying the map, the maps being overlaid. So you can actually see, you know, where, what the things are underwater and stuff like that. So it's another, albeit simple, but an important um, kind of benefit and use case in there. So yeah, I really do think maybe that the sky's the limit in terms of what kind of things will happen. And I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of other use cases. I think it will range from very simple, just getting businesses working more efficiently to, as you said, saving lives, which will just be amazing. I feel like with technology, there are, a couple of hurdles, speaking of adoption challenges. I think first the technology needs to exist, uh, which can solve a certain problem. And then it sometimes requires a mindset shift from the potential users of that technology. You know, sometimes people get very excited about a new technology, but sometimes they resist change as well. Uh, what do you see as the biggest hurdles for adoption of AR? And, and this is one of the things that the area focuses on a lot um, about helping overcome the barriers to adoption. We have a phrase uh, that was coined by our president, which is pilot purgatory. There are lots and lots of companies out there that have got a few devices, a few kind of software licenses, probably doing some really cool things, but then that's not being deployed wider across the organization. So, you know, we, within the area, we have a number of different committees, which are monthly meetings looking at some of these challenge areas. So to give you a quick run through of those, I've already mentioned security and overcoming some of the security issues that also may include just getting the devices added to the network. Sounds trivial, but can be quite complicated and, and they need to be managed and looked after. Safety, again, I've mentioned that a few times, so I won't go over that too much, but just making sure that you're wearing, you're using the devices safely and you're also using them for safety kind of problems as well. We have a human factors committee. We're sort of, to be honest, I, I still feel we're designing some of the experiences in a 2D, with a 2D feel to them rather than a 3D. So there's lots of opportunities there and that can be a barrier. Some people might not like the way they have to interact. You see lots of people kind of, poking and pushing and trying to move the uh, um, the interface on. We have a requirements committee, which is actually defining a set of requirements for the industry. You know, and we want to be able to push that, but make sure that we have business justification for it as well. So we've defined some hardware and software and use case specific requirements. Um, and, and whilst this is not a committee within the area, but the whole kind of financial and business benefit part I think, you know, the devices at the moment aren't cheap. Um, I'm sure with with bigger volumes, they will reduce in price. And if, when we get a little bit more kind of uh, use case specific, they will be more tailored to um, appropriate ROI. But that's something that, uh, that needs more work on. And again, through the area of research kind of capability we have, we focused on that um, kind of managing stakeholders so they understand the benefits, also the end users. So when you actually deploy a uh, AR solution within an organization, it's really important if you need to think about the actual end users, making sure that it solves their business problems and they, they're involved from the very start. They're actually you know, designing the solution because they're the ones actually doing the work. And the stakeholder side, you know, it's all about showing return on investment. How much does technology cost? But more importantly, how much are going to make or mainly in the enterprise use cases, cases, how much am I going to save? Okay, so it's about saving money. And that sometimes from a CEO and a CFO can be a little bit more difficult. They always want to make some more money. So it's on about making good savings, you know, improving the performance of their organization. And I mentioned that little phrase earlier, getting the most contextual, relevant, up-to-date information to their staff when they need it so they can make informed decisions. Is it always easy to uh, understand what that return on investment is? Is it always quantifiable to show those cost savings to CEOs? Or sometimes does the conversation veer into the intangible benefits, uh, uh, you know, territory 
uh, and and that's where of course ultimately like you said if 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 a ceo sees the roi that will uh, facilitate further adoption of of the technology and further investment uh, how do you see that that divide between uh, concrete roi statistics versus uh, some intangible uh, discussions uh, regarding uh, success and measuring success it's a great question and you know a lot of the companies that have deployed ar solutions and are getting a real benefit are the kind of pioneers you know they're the early adopters and every technology goes through the kind of early adopters phase what I'm seeing now is more and more enterprises becoming interested in the technology because they begin to understand what problems they can solve. So within the area, we've done quite a lot of work and we've actually created an ROI uh, calculator for people. Now, the first thing I get, Mobin, is when people use it, they say, well, it's quite complicated. I go, well, actually, unfortunately, the exercise of creating ROI is not trivial. You know, you have to go kind of do some be it kind of time in motion studies, how long does it take people to do things? And then it's a kind of a multiplication game. You know, you can multiply it by the number of minutes, say, by the number of the people that you've done. So I always recommend that uh, companies are looking to create an ROI calculation um, on immersive technology is they measure how long it takes them to do a task first. I know it sounds strange, but I've had a few companies and you say, well, yeah, what benefits do you get? And they say, well, to be honest, Mark, we didn't really measure how we used to do it. Everyone's using it and they kind of have a gut feel that it's quicker and better, but we didn't measure it first. So there are some fundamentals. Measure how you do it now. Obviously, you know, measure how, you Im how your improvement has been by using AR. There are some kind of gotchas or potential challenges. You know, things like having the data in the right format and available to you is quite important. And that could be part of a digital transformation bigger program. You know, if all of your step-by-step -step instructions are in PDF, that may be a little bit more difficult to manage and stuff like that. So we've got a really nice kind of supporting best practice that talks a little bit about that. Also things like most projects now are done on a kind of dynamic process. You know, you're doing requirements as you go. And that sometimes doesn't work as well when you're looking to create an ROI calculator because it never seems to be an end date. You know, there's always kind of improvements and stuff like that. So there's a few things around the, if you like, the the actual process of creating the ROI calculator. Um, I think working with the stakeholders, there's one really nice anecdote story um, I can give you. I won't say the company, but they were really focusing on demonstrating this technology to as many people as they, they could. And one day they had a meeting with the CTO of the organization. This person come on and tried out the technology, didn't say anything, put it down, left, and jumped onto his phone, make a phone call. You know, and, and the story goes, this person thought, that's it. You know, we're having all of our funding pooled. This person didn't like it, blah, blah, blah. But actually, what the CTO was doing was speaking to the CEO and saying, you need to come down and see this. This is going to kind of revolutionize our business, and this is going to make, you know, some great cost savings for us. So, you know, there's a combination of some very tangible measurement stuff, some managing um, stakeholders and doing the right things to show them that there's real benefits. And I loved your point on the intangible bits. There's some really interesting stories that I've been told, um, especially maybe companies that have a higher age profile. So a huge amount of expertise, but they're going to be walking out the door of retirement in the next five to seven years or something like that. There's a kind of some stats behind this. So again, companies are use, using AR to capture that information. So they're either doing it by video and what they've done or kind of creating step-by-step -by, -step by using kind of an AR solution. That's great. So it's creating all that kind of knowledge into one, um, into one system, into one database. But what it's doing as well, it's really encouraging the next set of workers, the younger people to come into the organization so they say, well, I'm going to be using those cool devices or that cool kind of technology. Yeah, I'm up for a bit of that. So, you know, in, in industries that may struggle to recruit younger people, you know, the, the technology, AR technology can really be a benefit there. And that's why, you know, we talk about the intangible benefits. There's things like that that you don't really measure or is more difficult to measure. You know, if you said the time saved CO2 emissions and things like that, 
that's measurable, but you know, creating a knowledge base and encouraging the next set of workers you know, is going to be important. It's nice that you mentioned this, that, that the younger workforce is getting excited about uh, using these tools. I know when it comes to artificial intelligence, there is this this tension, I suppose, uh, between the the camps where one camp says it's going to replace human functions and the other camp says, no, it's going to enhance human functions. And, you know, humans will still be around. Uh, they'll still find work, but AI will make us more productive and so forth. Uh, do you see uh, AR doing the same function that, you know, it, it just allows humans to be more productive. The human element will still be there, but humans will just be able to do a lot more and uh, achieve a lot more and be more productive. I think that's exactly it. I mean, you know, if you could, um, let's say, you know, you've been a worker that has done the same task for, I don't know, 10 years. Now with the use of AR and having that, you know, say overlay of information, step-by-step -step guide, all of that kind of support that you can visually see, even if you've got your hand in an engine or, you know, you're doing another, another task. Now they can do more complicated tasks or different tasks. You know, it's a really simple example, but kind of rings true for me a little bit. You know, my washing machine broke down a, a while ago. Okay. So the person come out, kind of fixed it and it was great. But also at that time, my oven was broken. Now, that person could have potentially used AR to look at the problem and, and solve that problem immediately. Again, there may be some AI that would have helped to show if we could describe the problem or they could have seen the problem by me showing them on a phone, stuff like that. They could make sure they got the right parts. You know, so there's some real efficiencies in terms of, you know, using the technology. And I think, you know, there will be some roles and some tasks that may become obsolete. I think it will actually enrich a lot of people's jobs and roles because they can do a lot more, a lot more effectively. You know, and let's be honest, it took three weeks for the engineer to come out to fix the washing machine. You know, three weeks of going to the laundrette wasn't great. So, you know, anything we can do to improve that timeline is going to help everybody. So as we draw to a close, Mark, uh, it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on what lies ahead. And I know... Um, you, you work with, with businesses, uh, and I know as, as consumers, uh, you know, we've, we've seen uh, companies like Apple and Meta generate or trying to generate uh, interest with very expensive uh, headsets. They probably veer more into VR territory, uh, but uh, it would be useful to get your sense of what uh, excites you going forward um, in in the next year or so, or how do you see the biggest trends playing out in the VR space? In the the AR and VR space, um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think you know it's going to be an interesting year. Uh, you know, the devices need to improve. I've mentioned that before. Um, I think the Apple device is is a great device. Uh, there's some great kind of use cases from a consumer perspective. Um, I'd like to see that improved. There are a few things that I think can be improved. But ultimately, I think the devices need to become yeah, faster, more easier to wear or more comfortable uh, with greater power and cheaper. And some of those things don't actually add up as a, as a business calculation. But to become um, a device that you know, everybody wants to use, some of those things are going to have to somehow we need to work it out. But the technology, as we well know, increases so quickly. I do like the idea, and I think we'll see more and more kind of focused things. You've seen the Meta device um, from Ray-Ban. It does some really nice kind of AI examples. I think we'll see more devices like that, that are for a particular kind of task. It could be for cyclists or runners or you know, just people consuming kind of content, but they'll be specific for that and not try and do everything. Um, I think the display bit will become even better. I've spoken to companies that are actually now looking to use technology for with um, contact lenses, you know, put an AR in contact lenses and stuff like that. So, and ultimately that um, AI level or AI layer will, yeah, through the right kind of processes and making sure that the content, content 
is correct um, and not hallucinating and things like that will be a massive bonus. There will be things that we can't even think of now that we'll be able to do, you know, using AR, XR, VR, and the combination of AI. Uh, I think it's really exciting. It probably needs someone a lot cleverer than me to come up with some of the great use cases, but I'm absolutely sure that there's going to be some amazing things coming up in the not too distant future. Mark, this has been an extremely interesting conversation. But before we let you go, for our audience who wish to engage further with your work, tell us where they can follow you and your insights and the work of AREA. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, please go to the AREA website, www.thearea.org. As I say, we're a not-for-profit organization. We run through kind of membership fees. Or connect with me on um, LinkedIn, Mark Sage, nothing else. Um, and love to speak to anybody kind of interested in the area. I'm sorry, interested in the AR space or the immersive technology space as well. You know, I think it's one thing I want to do is just help people understand what the technology is and how it can benefit them. So happy to speak to anybody. And maybe thank you very much for you and your kind of team for allowing me to have this opportunity today. It was our pleasure and a very, very engaging conversation. I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Next Big Thing, a Megatrends podcast. If you want to hear more from us, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using. And please take a moment to leave us a five-star rating. You can follow us on LinkedIn. And you can follow me on LinkedIn as well or Twitter, x at Mubin Tahir WT. And if you want to learn more about megatrends, please visit Wisdom Tree's website. Join us again for another interesting topic next time. We'll see you then. Bye.